to Acts chapter 13. That's funny. We've been in this series in the book of Acts for about 20, well, this is, I guess this is the 19th or 20, 20th installment. We're almost about to get halfway through. But I've been getting so much out of it. There's so much in this book, guys. It's, it's just powerful. I, I believe this is the church that God wants for us to be. And this morning, just a simple message that you've heard times and times and times again, over and over and over and over. It's a message that causes great rejoicing. It's a message that causes great divide and great hatred and great anger. But it's the message that binds us together. Acts chapter 13, verse 13. Paul and his companions, we left last week. They were into Cyprus and we saw what God did there. And now they're in Antioch of Pisidia. And they're going from Paphos to Perga to Pamphylia. Man, I'm telling you, there needs to be a class just on pronunciation of words in the Bible. There is, actually. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. We're going to be readdressing John at a later time. But they went from Perga and came to Antioch and Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. So they're in a Jewish atmosphere here. They're walked into the synagogue in this service for a word that we can relate to. And they're just sitting down. We know that they've been commissioned and sent out by the church in Antioch. And now they have found themselves in a Jewish synagogue. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. We've just had several words of exhortation for you. Imagine it like that, for us to be able to relate to what's going on. They're in a service, and they just came in and sat on the back row, not, not wanting to cause problems not wanting to make a scene or anything. They just come into the synagogue and they sit. And then after they went through worship, they read the law, they read the prophets, somebody sent word to Paul and Barnabas on the back row and said, hey guys, uh, if you have something for us, a word of exhortation, then give it to us. Now that's an opportunity right there. It's such a unique opportunity. They've been commissioned, they're sent out as missionaries, and if you have one shot of one message that you can give these people. Maybe they've been there before. Maybe they haven't been there before. Maybe this will be the only time that they ever hear Paul's voice. We don't know. But we know he's been given an opportunity. What would you say? You know, I kind of experienced that last week whenever we was going through these interviews. What just happened in the service with the cameras and all that is just so small. Interview after interview, asking question after question after question. And I thought, okay, one shot, one chance to answer these questions in a way that would glorify the name of Jesus. What would you say? That's where Paul's at. He has one opportunity in this huge synagogue of all these Jews to bring one word. And I want us to look at the word that he brings. And I think as we do that, we're going to see a commonality Because it's the word that's changed our lives. Paul stood up, motioning with his hand, and he says, Men of Israel, you who fear God, listen, the God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. Immediately, he introduces them to God, who they are standing under. And we know that Jesus has come and he's going to bring it to this. But Paul goes all the way back. See, we feel like that we've entered into the age of grace when the cross came, and we certainly have. But let me tell you, from its inception, our journey with God has been Him chasing us. His goodness being poured out on His people. And a lot of times we get diverted on that thinking that, We've done something great to make God pour His blessings out upon us. Let me tell you, it's all God. And it's always been God. And Paul's about to prove this point. He says, it was God. The God of this people chose us. And He made our people great during the stay of the land of Egypt. He didn't say Joseph was a great leader, wasn't he? 
Guys, th thank God for Joseph. Thank God for Abraham. He stepped out and he was just awesome. He said, no, it was God that chose Abraham. He chose our fathers. It was God when we were down in Egypt that made us great. I mean, I'll give props to Joseph. He's okay. But it was God that made us great during that time. And he says, with outstretched arm, he led them out of it. And for 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. You ever feel like God's putting up with you? Every day of my life. But man, he's so full of love and mercy. And gives us chance after chance after chance after chance. And in his little dissertation there, you can see over and over. It was God that chose the fathers. It was God that made them great in the land of Egypt. It was God that led them out of it by outstretched arm. It was God that put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. I want you to just stop and look at this over and over and over again. We get in our mind. No, they had a great army. It was a great army of Israel that dispossessed those nations. It was the great warriors of Israel. And I'm sure they had the tales of the great warriors that went in and they fought and took it. And Paul's just saying in all this, it's always been God. God gave us the nations. God dispossessed those seven nations. It wasn't us. It was God. He gave them the land of Canaan as their inheritance. And all this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges to judge the nation. And then he gave them Samuel the prophet. And they asked for a king. And God gave them Saul the son of Kish. Once again, all of this, God, God, God did, God said, God provided, God conquered. And after that, when he had been removed, he raised up David to be their king. Now the Jews held David in high honor. He's the greatest king to ever walk the planet. And Paul's saying that wasn't because of David. It was God that used David. God gave us David. He said, I found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all of my will. And of this man's God, of this man, of this, blah, 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 of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a Savior. He's saying it's always been God. God chose our fathers. God made us great. God brought us out. God put us into the land as an inheritance. God dispossessed the nation. God gave us judges. God gave us Samuel, the prophets. God gave us Saul. God gave us David. And now here we are once again. God has provided for us again in the fact that he brought Jesus. And he's in this Jewish synagogue. And he says he's brought to us now a savior as he's promised. And before his coming... God even had John proclaimed the baptism of repentance. And when John was finished his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I'm not he. But behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I'm not worthy to untie. My first point this morning in Paul's sermon, his one shot the one opportunity he has to speak to these people, he's been given this great opportunity in this synagogue to let his message be heard. His first point is, we are who we are because of God. And he's starting this whole message of grace. Let me tell you, grace is God moving on our behalf. Grace is not, we worked hard to dispossess those nations. Grace is God gave it to us. Grace is not, we did a great job overthrowing those Egyptians. Grace is God came in and did it for me. He's starting this message of grace. It's always been God. And then he continues. Second point is this. 
brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent this message of salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, they didn't recognize or understand the utterances of the prophets who are read every Sabbath. Fulfilled them by condemning him. Over and over and over, guys. We've said in synagogues, you've heard the prophecies, you've heard the words. I'm telling you, it was Jesus that fulfilled it. You've heard it, and here I am again. I'm going to tell you again, it was Jesus that was the fulfillment of your whole life study of the books and the prophets. And they found in him no guilt worthy of death, and they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took down from the tree and they laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who we are now witnesses to his people. And we bring you the good news of what God has promised to our fathers. This he fulfilled to us his children by raising Jesus, we are carriers of that message of salvation. His first point was, guys, it's always been grace. It's always been God moving for us. And we're here because we're carriers of that message. That's why we're here in this synagogue. And I ask you this morning, don't get lost in all this reading because I'm going somewhere with this. Look at verse 36. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his generation, he fell asleep and was laid with his fathers, and he saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything. By him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. This is the most powerful truth in the entire Bible. Let me tell you a little story of my life and your life. We have spent so much time of our life trying to do our best, trying to earn, trying to get favor. We start as a small kid in school, and we get something at the end of the semester. It's called a report card. They're about to be released again. Let me tell you Richie Clendenin and Renee Clendenin's story of the report card. We would work hard because there were regulations on what my father wanted to see on that report card. And if those regulations were not met on that report card, then the Board of Education would be applied to the seat of discipline. Usually... Here's the rules. I really want you to make A's. I'll take B's, but if we got C's, we're going to have a problem. That's just how it was in our home. You, you do whatever you want to do with your kids. I'm just telling you my life. So I'd work hard, and I'd really, really want to make good grades. But I inevitably came up with C's. It was usually in conduct, believe it or not. We used to get a conduct grade, and that's, that's where my C's would show up from time to time. I like to talk when I wasn't supposed to be talking. I like to make people laugh when the teacher was trying to teach. Hetty, do not make any comments right now. This is... She's already been telling stories. She's texted three people. He sure did. And then I get home, and I sit with my dad, and I hand him my report card. My head hung in shame because I knew I never did good enough. It wasn't that he was trying to make me something I wanted. He just wanted the best out of me. But it was me working 
in me receiving a grade for my work and I always fell short. Let me tell you the beautiful thing about grace. God takes your report card of life and he wads it up and throws it in the trash can. And what grace says at the name of that report card, it's not you, it's Jesus. And instead of you trying to work so hard your whole life and always coming to the Father, God, I tried my best and I fell sometime on Thursday. God, I was there on Sunday. I worshiped. I was doing the best. I was super Christian. And then Wednesday morning happened, and this person really made me mad at work, and I said a bad word, and I smacked him in the... No, I didn't do that. <laughs> and I fell straight on my face. I looked at something on the Internet I wasn't supposed to look at. I watched a movie I wasn't supposed to watch. My attitude got the best of me. Here's my report card. Hung my head in shame. And you're just waiting for the Father to administer discipline. Because you know you failed. Let me tell you the beautiful thing about grace. When you are in Jesus, there is no failure on your part. When you're in Jesus, there's no condemnation for you for when you have that problem that you messed up in the middle of the week. That's what the blood of Jesus is for. And you come back to the cross over and over again and you repent again and God comes and when you're expecting to get discipline for your failures God says son I'm not even looking at what you did I'm looking at what Jesus did once and for all for you that's the beauty of grace it's the message the world needs to hear time and time and time and time again but it's a message that is not received. I've spoken on grace a thousand times in this church. And I'm telling you, it's the most important message that you'll ever hear. And Paul has this one shot. One shot. And he says, he basically lays their life out before them. He says, here's been the pattern that you've been in your whole life. You've been working. You've been trying to get this. You've been trying to do this. But let me tell you, it was God when you thought it was you being good. It was God. And now here we are again. God's done it again. And what you couldn't fulfill in your flesh, according to the law of Moses, Jesus fulfilled for you. And there's forgiveness and freedom in everything for you. You would think that that message would make people do back springs and cartwheels down the altars of churches all across this nation. Nope. We like our works. We like our filthy rags righteousness and what it produces. We like what our report card says. We like to stick our report card on the refrigerator and show everybody when they come through. We like to put the bumper sticker on the back of our car. I have an honor roll student. They're so good. And that's fine. Be proud of your kids. But don't be proud of your flesh and your works. Be proud of what Jesus did. Because I'm telling you, it's not just a little bit of grace and then you do the rest and meet God halfway. He did not meet you halfway. He came the full way. He left his throne and came to you 100% of the way. When you weren't even looking for him, that's what he did for you. You're not getting it. I'm telling you, it is exciting. The fact that you don't have to be caught in that system anymore. Quit wasting your time trying to earn the favor of God. You have it in Christ Jesus. We spend our life trying to earn something that God already gave us. We struggle, we fight, we sit in a pew thinking I'm not good as the guy next to me. Everybody else is a good Christian. If everybody in this church knew what I've done though, they'd kick me out of the front door. 
me tell you, we're all the same. And it's another message. Should we go on sinning so grace can abound? Paul says, by no means. By no means. I'm not saying it doesn't matter how you live your life. I'm saying how you live your life doesn't earn favor from God. How Jesus came and paid the ultimate price. That's where your favor with God comes from. And no other place. You would think people would be so excited to hear that message. To think that these Jews that had spent their entire life trying to fulfill the law of Moses when they heard this. Man, they would be excited. They would have a Pentecostal hold down, shouting up and down the aisles. It's been broken no more. Hallelujah. Nope. Their response is pretty much indicative of the human response to this message. The first response we see is this. Verse 42. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. There were some that were intrigued to hear more. And you'll see that. Some people, they're not ready to make a commitment to Jesus. They're not ready to go all in. Say, okay, I believe. I want me some of that. I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Why don't you come next week? Why don't you come next week? I'd like to hear a little. This has been my whole life here. Guys, you're just coming from Antioch, and I understand it. This is a powerful message, but I'm not quite getting it yet. Come, come back next week. I want to hear some more. That's what some people are, and I get it. They're not ready yet. Still a little doughy in the middle. Got to be stuck in God's oven a little bit more. They're not ready yet to jump all in. That's where some people find themselves. Second response is this. Look at verse 48. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying that the word of the Lord and as many were appointed to eternal life believed. Let me tell you what the Gentiles represent. The worthless heap of rubble to the Jews. Because they were God's chosen people. They were the ones that were favored. And the Gentiles didn't deserve this word. They were just sinners. To him who's been forgiven much, he loves much. The message of grace is like honey in the mouth of a sinner. We've seen it the world over. We've experienced it the world over. The message of grace to somebody that knows that they're at that place of failure. Man, it lifts you up. And you realize I couldn't fulfill it. I never could fulfill it. I never am going to be able to do it. But God found me just like I am. And he loves me just like I am. God loved you, that while you were still yet a sinner, he died for you, and he gave himself for you. Aren't you thankful that you don't have to clean up and put on a suit and tie and shave and put on some nice smelly cologne and deodorant and then go to church and then you sit in there and then God loves you enough to save you? But that's how we act. Got my suit and tie on, my nice little smelly cologne. Matter of fact, as my dad always said, if you're going to smell, then good's better than bad. You clean yourself up. Why do we do that? Well, different hearts. You know, we need to give our best to God, and I'm not saying that's not. But a lot of us do that to think God will love me now. God is love. God loved you last night when nobody else knew what you were doing. God loved you when you were strung out. God loved you when you were addicted. God loved you when you were shacked up with somebody that's not your wife. 
God loved you when you were the most promiscuous person in the county. God loved you when you were addicted to internet pornography. And that's how you spent all your time. That's who God came and sent his son to die for. That's the message of grace. That when we were at that place, and when the Gentiles heard it, they knew what they had done. And when they heard the message of grace, they started rejoicing greatly. Thank you, Jesus. That's where I've been, but that's not. Thank you, Jesus. What I believe the message in America needs to be to the church today, we need to recapture the truth of what Jesus actually did. So many churches have moved beyond the cross. May we never do that. May we never preach some social message that sounds all nice and warm and fuzzy. Because that's the message that sinners need to hear. Are we okay? Not without Jesus. But if you run to Him, it doesn't matter what place you're in. He will clean you up. He will change your life. Some people needed to hear a little bit more, and I get it. The Gentiles, the sinners, when they heard this, man, their worlds were rocked. But who was it that rejected the message of grace? Look at verse 49. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and leading men of the city, stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and they drove them out of their district. You have got to be kidding me. Let me tell you who hates grace, the religious. There ain't nobody that hates the word grace like the religious. Those that he's in church with, he's in the synagogue with, not church, he's in the synagogue with. Those that felt like they were favored of God. Because they were God's chosen people. I'm better than those people over there. Say, I'm chosen of God. I'm I'm really got something here. I've spent my whole life trying to fulfill the law of Moses. God really loves me. Man, I'm good. See, we won't quite say it. But truthfully, if you get down in the heart of us, we believe God loves us just a little bit more than he loves those that's doing what we hate. Don't don't act like you haven't driven to church and you've seen people mowing their yard and you're thinking, it's church day, don't you know that? (laughs) Don't act like you haven't been at the gas station filling up before church and you see somebody there in a pair of shorts and t-shirt with a boat about to go to the lake and you think, good, what has this nation become? (laughs) If they could only be like me and just go to church and be nice and... And I love church. I'm not speaking against church. The heart of it is that we believe God loves us just a little bit more. Because we're favored. We're the favored ones. No, God loves that person out there skiing right now as much as he loves you sitting in his house. He loves the yard mower on Sunday morning. With the cigarette hanging out of their mouth mowing their yard. He loves them to the same degree he loves you. Sitting here smelling all pretty. Prettier than a prayer book. Here on Sunday morning with your beautiful family. He loves them as much as he loves you. But they could not get that message. And they hated him for it. To think, that's a church service that's gone south, guys. He's in there, guys. Yes, it's grace. Jesus has come. It's not the law of Moses anymore. It's grace. Throw the report cards away, guys. Look at Jesus' report card. Look how great it is. And they said, get out of here. Why 
do we hate the message of grace? I don't know, but I can tell you, religious people sure do. They always have. They started inciting people up. Hey, stir it up. Let's get these guys out of here. They're going to mess this all up. We got our nice little cliques and hierarchies here in the synagogue. This one's here, this one's here, this one's here. He's coming and saying everybody can be the same based upon the blood of Jesus. Get out of here. We don't need that around here. No way God loves those stinking, filthy Gentiles as much as he loves me. I'm a chosen person of God. Just look at me. It's obvious God loves me more than he loves everybody else. I'm telling you, it's in the heart of man. It's in the heart of the Christian. We genuinely believe that. Paul had one shot. And he hits them with the message of grace. And he wads up their report cards in front of the synagogue and throws them out. And he makes a new one with the name of Jesus up there and says, this is what he did. Forget about you getting a curse because of your actions and shortcomings. You're going to get the blessings of God because of what Jesus did. Some said, I want to hear more about this. Some said, hallelujah. I will take me some of that and a double helping, please. And some said, not me. But the crowd that said, not me, were those that thought they were religious in the first place. Let me tell you something this morning. If you're sitting here thinking, Richie's gone hyper grace. That ain't the truth. If you're standing against this message, you're standing against the heart of the gospel. That is the heart of the gospel, guys. Man, it's all because of what Jesus did. we got to capture that message. Where are you this morning? Curtis came up to me during the service. He was saying, I feel this so strong in my spirit that there's so many people here this morning. It's not that they feel like God's failed them, but they feel like they failed God. That's a lot of people here this morning. Because we've hung our head in shame. Report cards full of C's and D's and F's and incompletes. And didn't show up to class. Got all these notes of everything that we did wrong. You can live that life. Or man, you can take what Jesus did and live your life as an act of worship to him for what he's done. Can I, just, can I just talk and not preach for a minute? That's what I've been doing anyway. Man, I'm so sick of that life. Invite people to Jesus. Now you get your long list of things, and we're good to hand those out. Do's don't do. Now that you're a Christian, do this. Read your Bible. Ditch all your friends. Only hang out with Christians. Pray, come to church, give, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Now that you're a Christian, let me tell you, you don't need to do this. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And you've got this long list. And if you're anything like me, all of your life is, okay, do, don't do, do, don't do, do, don't. Until you get it. That's not what life in Christ is supposed to be. Because the truth is, it's no longer Richie that lives. It's Christ that's living in me. And if you live your life, instead of trying to walk a tightrope, let me tell you, I'm a big man. Tight ropes in me don't work. But if your life is lived as an act of worship to Jesus for what he did, instead of a list of regulations, that will kill you. That list of regulations will kill you. And if that's how you're going to live your Christianity, that is an endless cycle, and you'll be living that cycle till the end, till the last breath that you take. It never ends. But 
man, it's so beautiful when we get it. In our life, we might do and don't do the same thing. But instead of me setting out to do this or don't do this, I just wake up in the morning and my prayer now is, Lord, don't let me do this. Don't let me do this. Help me to do that. My prayer is, God, let me live my life in worship to you. That's what true worship is. When we sell out and our life is an offering, that living sacrifice. See, you're the one that's supposed to be on the altar. Well, Richie, you said worship. That's not worship. Worship is that first 30 minutes of the service. You ought to get that. You're the pastor of a church. That's not worship. Worship is this. Raise your hand, sing, la, 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 la. That's not worship. That's not worship. Do you think God wants this? That he hung naked on a cross for hours so you would lift your hands? Your worship is your life. The greatest song you'll ever sing is your life song to Jesus. And when we get that, man, that's what pure worship is. It reminds me of one of my favorite stories in the Bible. In 1 Samuel, when God, am I good or is everybody getting hungry? Okay, all right, all right. I'm going to keep going. Saul was told by God, if you remember this, because now I, I'm not going to lie, I'm not preaching, I'm meddling now. Saul, when he was told by God, completely destroy Amalek. Don't spare a thing. So Saul goes in and guess what? He saved the best of the livestock, kept king alive. And he comes back and Samuel says something to him. He says, what in the world are you doing, son? He said, what are you talking about? We've taken Amalek. And Saul says, why are you mad? Samuel says, you might have taken Amalek, but you've totally disobeyed the, God, the Lord. God said, destroy everything. Why do I hear the bleeding of sheep in my ears? Do you not know that obedience is better than sacrifice? And Saul's response was, come with me and worship in front of the people. I want to ask you a question this morning. What in the world did Saul have to offer God at that point that he would have accepted? A disobedient life. And all he cared about was a physical action so everybody else could see him. And Samuel says, let me tell you something. The throne has been removed from you this day. Now, I know that's harsh, but that's the lifestyle of me a lot, and you. We live in, in rebellion to God, and then we come in and we sing a song, and we raise our hands, and we feel like we worship God. And we're giving Him something that He does not want. What He wants from you is your life. He wants every part of you, not in a list of regulations, so you will do this and won't do this. He wants you to get what he did. And then he wants your entire life to be this beautiful worship service played out before him. All right, you're getting hungry. I can see it in your eyes. Father, we thank you for grace. We thank you for the message that's changed all of our lives. Jesus, and truthfully, just like it's always been you in the life of the Israelites, Lord. Lord, as I look back over my life, it has always been you. Every accolade, every accomplishment that I have ever done, Lord, has always been you. Lord, in this morning, Lord, I know we're going to do this in heaven. But right now, Lord, I take my crown off and I lay it at the feet of him who is worthy. You are the worthy one of God. Lord, you paid the price. 
Lord, I've lived a life of waiting for a report card to come so I can be excited about, look how good I did. Not anymore, God. Lord, because I have finally understood what you've done, Jesus. And this morning, Lord, if anybody in this place can take anything from this jumbled mess, Lord, help us to leave these doors with a fuller understanding of what you've done, Lord. And help us to leave with a fuller understanding of what grace actually is. Because we know what we could not accomplish in the law of Moses. You paid that price once and for all. And the only way we're ever going to be okay is to get that. And to find ourselves in you. And to receive your atoning work on the cross in our lives, Jesus. Lord, I'm bold enough to believe there's people here this morning, Lord. In all three of those situations, Lord, that I spoke about, some need to hear a little bit more. Some are rejected because they like what they've accomplished. But there's some that are ready to glorify you and to just jump in both feet with that message. With every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, I'm going to ask you to do something bold. If that's you this morning, I'm not saying you're the rankest sinner on earth. That's not what I'm saying. And I don't even care what you've done because I know the blood of Jesus is big enough. But if you're bold enough to say, Richie, it's been an endless cycle in my life. I've lived it and I've constantly found myself falling short. And I have given up time and time and time again. And I'm ready to receive the message of grace. I'm ready to stop that vicious cycle of my works and my failures. And I'm ready to totally receive what Jesus did. If that's you, I want you to stand to your feet this morning. I know you're in this place. And this is not to embarrass you. I know you're in this place. I know there's others in this place. I know you're in this place. It's the most powerful message if you can just receive it. I know there's more in this place. We're going to wait. I'm not in a hurry this morning. I know you're here. When you stand, you're saying, I'm done with that cycle. I'm done with trying to earn something. I'm done with the report card. I, I wad it up and throw it away this morning. I'm ready to receive what Jesus did and get me out of that life. I don't want that. I'm bold enough to believe that there's two more this morning that need to stand to your feet. God's dealing with you right now. I'm telling you, it's the best decision that you'll ever make. The Lord won't let me go on. God's dealing with somebody right now. Jesus, you are so good, Lord. You are so good, Lord. There's one more person that needs to stand to their feet right now. Throw your hands up in the air and say, I'm finished. Jesus, from this point on, it's all because of you. There it is. Would everybody just pray this prayer with me this morning? If you're standing to your feet as a sign of surrender, I just want you to lift both hands to heaven. And I want us all as a church to say this prayer together. Dear Jesus, thank you. Dear Jesus, thank you. I receive your work. I receive your atoning work on the cross. I receive the freedom that you've purchased for me. From this moment on, my focus is changing. I'm not going to focus on what I can do or what I can give. 
or what I can provide in my flesh. From this moment on, I'm living my life in surrender of what you did. You've set me free from the law of Moses because you fulfilled it. You've set me free from myself. You have set me free from my works. And this morning, I receive it. Everything you did, I receive it. It's always been you, God. It's always been you. Even when I succeeded, it was you. And from this moment on, may my life be lived in worship to my King. To the name that's above every name. I bow my knee to that name today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Isn't grace amazing? Isn't the love of Christ amazing? Man, He is so good. Thank you, Jesus. Can we just lift our hands and worship Him for a moment? I know it's late. Jesus, you're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. You are worthy, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for what you've done, Lord, and for what you did once and for all for us, Jesus. And we thank you that it's not longer any us. It's not us that lives anymore, Lord, but it's you that lives in us. Lord, we praise the name of Jesus that set us free from ourselves in that vicious cycle. We praise the worthy, acceptable Lamb of God. And we thank you, Lord, that we are counted righteous this morning, Lord. Not because of our works, Lord, but because of you. We are counted just as righteous as Jesus this morning because of the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just sing this with me this morning. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a mercy reigns unending love amazing grace my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed time. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Honey, I love you guys. Come back tonight at 6.30. Pray that you have a great day. You can be dismissed today.